Water is the lifeblood of all civilization. Without it, people simply can't live. In modern history, running out of water in the United States has never been a serious issue. Today, however, that's no longer the case. So what if the American Southwest runs out of water? Hello and welcome to What If Geography, where we try and answer the great geographic what if questions of the world. I'm your host, Jeff Gibson, and today we're going to talk about water, or rather the lack of it, specifically for the American Southwest, which has some acute water issues that are caused by natural disaster, population migration, and early 1900s water policies. But before we talk about this dry subject, we need to first talk about everything that's led up to today's looming water disaster. The American Southwest is a naturally dry place. It probably comes as no surprise that basically the entire region we're talking about today is a desert. But deserts are not without water at all. In fact, sitting under Phoenix, Arizona has been a historically large groundwater reserve that has helped feed the dramatic growth of the city resting on top of it. But groundwater hasn't been the only way the American Southwest has acquired its water. The other big source for much of the region has been the Colorado River. This specific river has been so important to the entire region that seven states had to create a legal and binding agreement in 1922 to determine who gets water from the river and how much. This agreement, termed the Colorado River Compact, divided the river into the upper basin and the lower basin. For the upper basin, the water is split among Colorado, which gets 51.75% of the available water, Utah with 23% of the water, Wyoming with 14%, and New Mexico with 11.25%. Arizona also gets a very small portion of the upper basin's water. For the lower basin, the water is split between California, which receives 58.7% of the water, Arizona with 37.3% of the water, and Nevada with 4%. In addition to these states, Mexico is allocated about 10% of the total volume of water from the entire river. To say that the Colorado River is heavily depended on would be an understatement. For while the Colorado River doesn't naturally flow through any major population centers, with the exception of a relative close Las Vegas, states have diverted the river in multiple ways in order to get water to areas where people actually live. Both the Los Angeles and Phoenix regions, with a combined population of about 23.7 million people, draw water directly from the Colorado River. Unfortunately, the Colorado River was never intended to supply water to so many people. Back in 1922, when these agreements were finalized, the Los Angeles region had about 1.2 million people and the Phoenix region with about 100,000 people. Even after the aqueducts were constructed later in the century, both regions' populations were a fraction of the current population that needs water today. And of course, all of this is combined with the reality that the western half of North America is undergoing a serious mega drought. Precipitation over basically every region in the West has been historically low. Even the notoriously wet and rainy Pacific Northwest has not been spared from unusually long, warm, and dry spells. Because the American Southwest relies primarily on the Colorado River and groundwater reserves, a lack of normal precipitation hits particularly hard. This has led to previously unthought of situations that we're seeing now, such as Lake Mead being at dangerously low water levels. If Lake Mead gets much lower, the Hoover Dam will no longer be able to run and Las Vegas will lose a major source of power. This would be a complete disaster for the city of Las Vegas, of course, but the entire region would also feel the added sting of less water overall. There is so much more to the history of water rights in the American Southwest and the causes of the mega drought. Today's video is not able to cover the intricacies and the complications of why the region is running out of water. Instead, we're going to focus on what happens if they do run out of water. But before we jump into some what if speculation, if you're enjoying this video, now would be a great time to subscribe. More great geography videos are just one click away. Much like we are seeing signals today, the path to a day without water entirely would be known well ahead of time. Water is highly monitored and there are systems and checks in place to ensure that one day you won't wake up and just magically find that the tap is run dry. Unless you're pulling from your own unmetered well, of course. The run up to the day without water would not be fun though. Much like we saw in Cape Town, South Africa in 2018, as that day draws closer and closer, there would be a sharp decrease in the amount of water you could use. At its most desperate point, each Cape Town resident could only use 13 gallons of water each day. To put this into context, the average American shower uses about 17 gallons of water and lasts about 8 minutes. Now think of all the other things you use water for throughout the day. In total, the average American uses just over 100 gallons of water per day for all of their needs. You would need to cut your water usage by about 90% to be at the same point as Cape Town residents were. Of course, this wouldn't just affect you personally. Agriculture markets would also be highly affected, which would have repercussions for the entire country and global markets. Wheat, leafy greens, pecans, grapes, and even cotton are all grown in Arizona. Crops, of course, take a lot of water to grow, and any disruption in their growth would take time to offset from elsewhere in the country. This slow, steady march to a day without water would be felt in all industries and every facet of life within the American Southwest. 
As people begin to feel the burden of less water overall, they're bound to look elsewhere to move. This would begin what would likely be one of the largest internal migrations in modern US history. Now, Americans are very lucky to live in such a large and varied country. While half the country is essentially under some form of drought-like conditions, the other half still has plenty of water. Migrating from one side of the country to the other is not all that difficult and is certainly easier than immigrating to another country altogether. For this reason, it's safe to assume that as water becomes more scarce, people will look to flee to other regions of the United States that are not water distressed. In particular, the Great Lakes region, New England, the Pacific Northwest, and even Alaska are primed to be on the receiving end of these climate refugees. In many ways, this would be a reversal of the pattern we've seen since about 1970 when people, tired of the winters and relative grime of the Great Lakes and New England cities, flocked to the American Southwest. Only instead of 20 million people migrating over 40 years, we could see as many or more people flee in just a few years. The combined populations of Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah is about 21 million people. Including California, there are about 60 million people who are in regions that could see water become a scarce commodity. As people flee from these large cities of the American Southwest, we're bound to see a repeat of what happened to Detroit in the early 2010s. As Detroit emptied, large areas of the city were essentially abandoned, and the city no longer had a tax base to pay for its obligations. This led to a decrease in services, which led to more people leaving, and so on. It was a vicious cycle. Only instead of a relatively slow and gradual process, it would happen at a pace that's never before been felt in the United States. City leaders would be left spinning trying to figure out what to do with basically no good options. This, of course, would have reverberating impacts around the entire country and, in particular, the cities that would be expected to absorb these fleeing populations. Our societal systems, such as the freight industry, are finely oiled machines attuned to relatively small amounts of growth. The city of Cleveland, Ohio, for example, can safely secure food for its 2 million people and distribute it to its residents through a network of grocery stores. An extra million added on top of the city over a short period of time, however, would throw this entire system into chaos as stores would become crowded and people forced to ration until industries are able to adapt, which would take years. But where this would be felt most acutely would be in housing. Housing in the country has already not been able to keep up with demand since before the Great Recession. This has led to a dramatic increase in the price of housing and homelessness overall. Each year, the United States as a whole adds about 1.5 million homes. But much of that is already concentrated in the Southwest, the very area where people would be fleeing from. As people flee to cities in the wetter regions of the country, housing stocks would dry up almost immediately. Home prices would skyrocket even higher, and Depression-era shanty towns would likely pop up in every major and minor city. For a single city, such as Cleveland, to be expected to add hundreds of thousands of homes per year would be a monumental task that it's simply not prepared for. The other regions of the country are not ready to absorb millions of climate refugees. It would bring absolute chaos to the everyday lives of people who live in those regions today. Resources would be strained, and people would be desperate. Thankfully, this specific scenario is not imminent today. Though there are worrying signs regarding the amounts of water available, the American Southwest won't run out of water anytime soon. That said, it's also not an impossible scenario and it would be wise for the country and states to begin planning for such an outcome. The American Southwest running out of water is a very scary proposition. Everybody would be impacted by it in some capacity. Unfortunately, with the mega drought not appearing to relent anytime soon, the region will be beset by water issues for the foreseeable future. Thankfully, there are some very smart scientists and engineers working to manage the area's water effectively. Hopefully with their efforts, the region will eventually emerge from the mega drought better able to effectively manage their water for generations to come. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, you can catch another one of my videos right here. And of course, I would greatly appreciate it if you subscribe to my channel. You can do that here. Thanks for watching. See you next time.